The psalmist writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And we're going to see that also in the form of holy baptism this morning. But before that, we sing the opening hymn, hymn number 593, See This Wonder in the Making. This morning we're going to baptize Elizabeth Marie Marth. As you see, we have a wonderful family before us, and she's got lots of little siblings who are anxious for her to also join them in God's kingdom. If you would join us by opening your hymnals to page 268, we'll begin the rite 
of holy baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter has written, Baptism now saves you. The Word of God also teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How are you to be named? Elizabeth Marie. Elizabeth Marie. Receive the sign of the Holy Cross both upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, According to your strict judgment, you condemned the unbelieving world through the flood. Yet according to your great mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea, yet led your people Israel through the water on dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of your holy baptism. Through the baptism in the Jordan of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold Elizabeth according to your boundless mercy and bless her with true faith in the Holy Spirit, that through this saving flood all sin in her which has been inherited from Adam and which she herself has committed since would be drowned and die. Grant that she be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, being separated from the multitude of unbelievers and serving your name at all times with a fervent spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believers in your promise, she would be declared worthy of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. They brought young children to Jesus that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and bless them. This is the word of the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord preserve your coming in and your going out from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Elizabeth Marie, do you renounce the devil? If so, answer, yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his works? If so, answer, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? If so, answer, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth? If so, answer, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit? 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. If so, answer, yes, I believe. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? If so, answer, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Elizabeth Marie Mark, do you desire to be baptized? If so, answer, yes, I do. Elizabeth Marie Mark, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You did beautifully. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. Receive this white garment to show that you have been clothed with the robe of Christ's righteousness that covers all your sin. So shall you stand without fear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the inheritance prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Receive this burning light to show that you have received Christ who is the light of the world. Live always in the light of Christ and be ever watchful for his coming that you may meet him with joy and enter with him into the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which shall have no end. In holy baptism, God the Father has made you now a member of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir with us of all the treasures of heaven in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. We receive you in Jesus' name as our sister in Christ, that together we might hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Indeed, let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you graciously preserve and enlarge your family and have granted Elizabeth the new birth in holy baptism and made her a member of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as she has now become your child, you would keep her in her baptismal grace, that according to your good pleasure, she may faithfully grow to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of your holy name. And finally, with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. We continue with the singing of the introit. Please rise.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in your deep compassion, you rescue us from whatever may hurt us. Teach us to love you above all things and to love our neighbors as ourselves. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Leviticus, chapters 18 and 19. 
When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest, and you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, who publish peace and bring good news of salvation. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. The epistle is from Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ of Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess the one true Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world.
In the name of Jesus, amen. The story of the Good Samaritan again raises a central question of man about his salvation. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Those who only give cursory attention to the scriptures' teachings will then cut to the chase, and they will only hear these words of Jesus, you go and do likewise, that is, show mercy. But is that really how we are saved? The scripture actually say, for by showing mercy you are saved. That salvation isn't a matter of what you do for your neighbor. Many do believe this just as the lawyer that day who inquired of Jesus. And if so, and we are saved by our observing and then keeping God's law, then why did Jesus have to come and suffer and die on the cross on our behalf? What then is the purpose of the gospel if we can save ourselves through the law? Well, it doesn't add up. So this story of the Good Samaritan, is it law or is it gospel? Is it really a matter of what we do? Or is there something more that Jesus is teaching, that he is engaging us to understand? If you cut to the chase, you will miss it and perhaps never obtain the hope of eternal life. But with the right lenses on, you will then see everything that Jesus is revealing. And so that we may understand rightly everything that God reveals in his word, there is a teaching of scripture that's essential to its correct understanding. And it will open up the whole of scripture to you, literally engage you in it. But few know it, really. Yet it is at the heart of all Lutheran teaching. You'll recognize it. It's the proper distinction between law and gospel. And this distinction is what makes clear all of Scripture and what it teaches about our salvation. A distinction that is essential to answering the question of that lawyer that day. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Without this distinction, the two are easily confused. And when the gospel and the law are confused, the gospel itself is always reduced to law. Such as in the teaching that we are saved, as it was taught at the time of the Reformation, by both faith and the good works that we do, mixing together the gospel with the law and finding then that the gospel loses its gospel nature and then is no longer the gospel, thus the reason for the Reformation. And yet, Scripture itself clearly teaches that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. The same with the belief that God has done his part in salvation, and guess what, now it's your turn. You have a part to play in it as well that you must fulfill. And that's another harmful, confusing concoction that if continuously drank will indeed affect saving faith. Scripture again clearly teaches, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. What this means is that knowing the proper distinction means knowing the difference between what Jesus came to teach and what the world actually believed. He came to teach the way of life and the world journeys on the way of death. I remember my first encounter with 3D. It was a Grand Funk Railroad album cover. I was 11 years old, and we won't question the wisdom of my parents of letting me have that. But to vindicate them, I am using it in a sermon illustration for good purposes. However, this album cover had fuzzy graphics on it. You can kind of see the images, but there was no real clarity to it. But it also came with these funky plastic glasses 
Oddly, one lens was blue and the other lens was red, and when you put them on and looked at the record label, it had a most engaging effect. The picture literally turned alive, and with stark clarity, it jumped right out to engage me in it, and I thought, oh my gosh, how cool is that? Well, today we have 3D movies, but without the glasses, the picture remains fuzzy, and we cannot clearly distinguish those most engaging and sometimes even frightful moments that 3D pictures are known for where the very life of the picture literally leaves the screen and jumps right out at us. At Disney World, one is so directly engaged with the Muppets and other Disney characters that it appears that we have went right into their world. It was so lifelike. And even more so, that they were actually coming into our world. To such a degree, you'd want to reach out and touch them. Or you would have to duck when the action of the movie comes flying out at you. And that really is the purpose of it, isn't it? To effectually experience the story by seeing ourselves right in the midst of it. All about us. And key to all of this were these special lenses. One blue and one red in one pair of glasses working together to affect the intended purpose, which was to engage you in the life of the story on the screen. If both lenses are blue or both are red, no 3D effect. But together in right order and in relationship, they work in harmony to produce the same intended effect, and that is to make things lifelike and to engage us in it. You see, Holy Scripture is the story of our salvation. Law and gospel are the distinct lenses through which we are literally engaged in the story, jumping out at us and pulling us and drawing us in, not only making things lifelike, but literally life engulfing. The glass frames properly distinguish the two by structuring them in their right place and relationship with one another, not overlapping but apart. That together they accomplish the same purpose for which both are given to us. Through these two lenses only, working together, we can see the scriptures clearly, know what they teach, and so obtain the gifts and the life that is therein, everlasting life. This is the key that unlocks all of Scripture. So simply, the law then, if we define it as what we do, it pertains to our works toward God, based on what God requires of us to do in the Ten Commandments, but understand that the law really wasn't given to us so that we, through it, can make ourselves righteous before God. But rather, it was given for another purpose, to reveal something about us that was necessary for us to know, and that is our sin. And with sin, then, our need for the gospel. It is written, Now the law came in to increase the trespass. Did you hear that? To increase the sin, perhaps so that you see it better. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A beautiful snippet of scripture about law and gospel. The gospel is what God does. It's what he is doing for our salvation. And because we couldn't keep the law, the gospel is Jesus keeping it for us perfectly what God requires of us, and then paying the full price of our sin when we never kept it, suffering sin's full punishment, even to the point of death. Jesus then delivers and imparts to us as gifts his righteousness, his forgiveness, and faith to receive it in both his word and in his sacraments, as little Elizabeth just did moments ago. 
The law does promise eternal life and salvation, but I wouldn't go that way because it's only on a certain condition that you keep it perfectly. But it has and offers no power either to help you do so. What the law really does then is it demands something of you and then threatens you when you don't do it. Do this or you will perish. And so it reveals to you a hard truth. And everyone must come to this point and realize, I have not kept it. I am a sinner. And it beats us up. It strips us of our self-righteousness. And then it leaves us lying half dead along the road of life. The gospel also promises eternal life and salvation, but it has no conditions because it is given as a gift, a promise of God's free grace. It asks nothing of us but that we believe. And then what it asks, it also then gives to us as a gift, faith. The gospel threatens nothing, but it only speaks words of comfort and consolation, picking us up, dusting us off, binding us up, and restoring us to life so that we may continue to go on our way for him. In summary, then, the law kills us, basically, through sin. But the gospel, the gospel makes us alive through the blood of Christ. Yet as different and distinct as these two doctrines are, they both work together for the same purpose, the life and salvation of you. In fact, you cannot have one without the other in order to accomplish that purpose. You see, the law without the gospel is just simply law and only condemns and it never saves. And the gospel then without the law lacks what it needs in making it known for the needs of the sinner. In other words, if one does not know or believe that he is a sinner, which the law makes known to us, then so also the sinner will not know his need for the gospel. So the law is necessary in preparing us for the gospel. And these two distinct lenses, if you will, working together in proper distinction, do so for the one ultimate purpose of your eternal life proper distinction. If you only have a blue lens, the law, then you don't have the gospel. And that is the sum of all the religions of the world, the religion of man, who believes that he must work his way back through the law to God. If you have a blue and red lens and they do not properly distinguish between the two and they overlap one another, then the law and the gospel become confused and they are mixed together in such a way that it strips the gospel of its saving nature and then it reduces it again to law, as we heard before. But notice this, too. If you only have a red lens that is only the gospel, that, too, results in error. Let me give you an example. How many of you remember the Crystal Cathedral? And its famous founder and televangelist pastor, who I remember hearing bragging that he will not preach the law. He will only preach the gospel. Only the positive. Only the positive of positive thinking. With the promise of reaching our fullest human potential. Well, that always sounds good, doesn't it? We're always striving for something like that. But I ask where that church is today. You can go look it up. But if that pastor had understood the law, he would have figured out that to reach our full human potential really is nothing more than living in the fullness of our old Adam nature as a self-made person or a self-righteous person who then sees himself as already good before God. So now it's time to engage in more good, more positive, more good things with the mindset that he then overcomes sin by doing his good. That, friends, is not the true gospel. 
And when his house of cards comes tumbling down, when difficulty and suffering hits him and all that he heard does not seem to work, all the positive, all the victory, all the success does not apply to him, and he's bewildered that he should encounter the opposite, such as suffering and difficulty, he cries out, why do bad things happen to good people? Do you remember that? That's a theological question that I think a philosopher tried to answer, not a true theologian. That's the wrong question. If he had heard the true word of God, if he had known the proper distinction between law and gospel, he would have known that through the law, there are truly no good people, only sinners. And that through the gospel, are you ready for this? Good things happen to bad people. Forgiveness of sins to the sinner good to the bad. The question is, why do good things happen to bad people? And I'll let Scripture tell you very clearly. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, that means we're bad people, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. By grace and the goodness of God, you have been raised up with Christ and seated with him in the high heavenly places. That's remarkable. That's a good thing. In Christ, bad people receive good things. Law and gospel. That house of cards came tumbling down because there was no place for God's law to be preached in order to reveal the sins of the people as sinners. And because of that, the true gospel neither had a place because the true gospel is in answer to the question of sin. And in that place, apparently, there were no sinners. No sinners in need of God's forgiveness because everybody was deemed good. And so a false gospel arose that put people's trust in their positive thinking and their ability to overcome sin with their good. That is the law and not the gospel. And right there is an improper distinction. And the end of those things is what has now become of this church. It has come to nothing. So, dear Christians... Holding and having this great treasure called law and gospel and its right distinction, you are now prepared and equipped to understand and to receive the fullness of God's blessing, to live in the joy of the pure gospel in all its fullness and every doctrine of the Christian faith. You are set free from all doubts about whether God truly loves you or not. You are now certain about the eternal place that you have with Him in heaven. You have the surety that your sins are forgiven. And you have his continued presence in your life here in time as a very present help in every need to carry you forth there into eternity. And so as we apply briefly this doctrine of the proper distinction of law and gospel to the story of the Good Samaritan, our eyes are then open to the truth that is hidden otherwise to those eyes still darkened by the law that sees then this story as another self-justifying to do. But to those of us enlightened by that teaching, we see something different. The answer to the question, is the Good Samaritan law or gospel, is this. It is gospel. The lawyer wants to justify himself, but Jesus teaches him gospel love and mercy of God in the Good Samaritan. And that likewise, the response of faith offered, given, and strengthened, and therefore enabled by the gospel, is likewise love and mercy, which does not self-justify, but freely gives and loves and blesses the neighbor. And so here's the point. The Good Samaritan is first and foremost Christ for us. And then... It is Christ in us toward our half-dead neighbor lying 
along the streets and roadways of this life. Gospel and love. So know that Jesus is the Good Samaritan. And we are that man who were beaten by the robbers, by Satan and his minions, who would rob us of all eternal life and blessing, and then are left for dead. Jesus comes along and he loves, and he mercies, and he risks the danger of the return of the robbers. He risks the danger of all the scorn of those who otherwise pass by. And then he kneels down to our broken bodies and our depleted souls, littered along life's broad path of destruction. And there he anoints us with the oil of the healing balm of baptism. Exactly what Elizabeth just got. And he cleanses and disinfects our sin-infested wounds with the wine of his blood to which she is now on her journey from the baptismal font to the altar for that purpose. And he feeds and nourishes and strengthens us with the bread of his body. He clothes us with the robe of his righteousness. He provides refuge for us in here, his house, this church. And he pays the full price and expense of our healing and recovery. Truly, 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 I say to you, by his wounds you were healed. Your sins are paid for. And not only that, he will come again and he will take you to his father's house. And in those halls, you will have your eternal life. And so today, that same good Samaritan comes again in gospel love and mercy to cleanse you and feed and nurture your law-broken bodies and souls and to work healing in you with his own broken body and shed blood now risen from the dead. And that as a sign and fulfillment of the promise that you too then shall live again as he now does in glory. It is in this joy now before us, receiving his love and mercy, that we will go out into the world and we will respond in faith Faith fed and strengthened to go and do likewise, to be merciful as he is merciful for the salvation and the life of the world in the one true gospel of Jesus Christ, justified in him. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, who came to your own and they did not receive you, grant us your spirit to glorify you in our hearts. Enlighten our souls with this living knowledge that you are the power of God and the wisdom of God, that we may never be offended in you, but may hold your righteousness with an unwavering faith and may not be ashamed to confess you before men and especially to bring your mercy to the world. In your most holy name, amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we confess that apart from your Son, Jesus Christ, we have no righteousness. Yet we rejoice that because your Son has died and risen for us, you promise that our righteousness exceeds even that of the scribes and Pharisees. Because we know the hope that you have laid up for us in heaven, let others see in us a confident faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a caring love for all those in need. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father in heaven, by your grace, we have died to sin, yet sin continues to overpower us. Bless all those who celebrate baptismal birthdays among us, and especially this day, Wyatt David and Elizabeth Marie. 
and fill us all with a repentant faith that knows we have been buried with Christ through baptism into his death. Fill us with the Samaritan's joy in helping those in need no matter what the cost to ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, as you grant the length of days to many in our families and communities, you bless us with their wisdom and grant us the opportunity to live out your love for them. Help us to rightly treasure them, and as they grow in weakness and need, deepen their trust in your strength to bear and your power to save. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, as you have granted us to live in a nation where your people may still gather without fear, bless our leaders with your wisdom and guard us from the rising ungodliness in our land, that your gospel may be preached boldly and continue to bear fruit and to grow. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, you have commanded that special attention and care be paid to the fatherless and the widows. Abide with all who are lonely. Use us to visit the homebound and those in care facilities, those who require ongoing care, and those in hospice. Especially do we remember Diana Wheeler, Dan Gard, Dave Narwald, Norm Sprague, and Cora Wallace, Phyllis Johnson, Gary Schmidt, and Reverend Doubledee, Jim Wheeler, Carol Robison, Sherry Nord, and Barbara Johnston, Linda Limer, and Sandy Rivas, and Linda Crone. We remember also Judy Walker and Lisa Yocolette, Crystal Hartman, James Parker, and Tom Fondalen. And we remember all those who so compassionately, mercifully, and lovingly care for them. And all our brothers and sisters in this congregation who are in need of our mercy and visitation, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father in heaven, you have been faithful to us who deserve none of your mercies. Lead us to receive them with grateful hearts and to be faithful unto death, that we may receive the crown of everlasting life. Hear us in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, through whom, with whom, and in whom be all glory and honor, both now and forever.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the redemption that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <coughs> Beautiful. Good morning to you. And welcome to all our visitors who are with us here today and all the families, and especially we welcome little Elizabeth into the fold of the Christian church. What a wonderful day, isn't it? Yes. Wonderful family, a wonderful day, and what a gift it is to be brought into God's eternal kingdom. So we are grateful for two baptisms today. Just before in the 8 a.m. service, we had the baptism of Wyatt David Clark, the newborn son to our seminarian, David Clark, and his wife, Megan, and then now also Elizabeth Marie. By the way, I have to let you know, we still need to receive you into membership, so we're going to work on that. We, haven't done, we have your transfer documents, but we're going to bring you up here and say, you're, you belong to us. So, yeah, very good. A few announcements before we go on our way today. 
Uh, the good news is, and I think it is good news, I found a note in here that said that we ended the fiscal year this year, which is the end of June, uh, in the black, which means we have no bills or outstanding debt. That's wonderful, at least for that year. Of course, we still have to pay down some of our facility, but that's good news. And we're grateful for your generosity and your faithfulness and your giving. Also, we have a few job openings for this coming year in the school. We need a part-time evening cleaner. We need some extended care workers and classroom aides. So if you are interested or know of someone who might be, please let us know about that. And finally, we have our VBS coming up uh, shortly. In fact, not this week, but the following week, the 18th to the 22nd. If you have not signed up your children yet or others you know that would want to come, please do so. And also, please consider volunteering. I'm sure there's a few other needs in that area that we could use your help. And remember, this is a great opportunity to get to know more of our families, our children, and families in the community. So please keep that in mind. With that said, it is wonderful to be with you here today. God's peace be with you. Have an excellent week. And uh, I'll see you because I get to preach one more time here before I go on my little leave. So I'm looking forward to the pulpit again. God's peace be with you.